Hello, Year Tens. How's it going, guys? Uh, Jack's still desperately trying to get in first. I think you actually made it once, Jack. Once upon a time. Anyway, right, guys. I'm going to crack straight on with finishing off chemical tests. So I'm going to share my screen. Switch my camera to my clip cam. Hey, guys. I'm going to crack Whoa. straight on with finishing off chemical tests. Oh, Julius has a hack method for something. Your Wi-Fi must be just, I don't know, uh, yeah, yeah, Julius has it. Julius is a stalker, possibly. Right, let's crack straight on. So today's lesson, guys, is the tail end of chemical tests, and it's about kind of just doing those little extra bits that don't really fit in anywhere. So here's our learning objectives. Number one, I need you guys to know the test for purity. Number two, know the test for water linked to the combustion train. I'll show you an image of that. And the last one is acidic and basic oxides and the test to prove this. Okay, so first thing, we can just do some nice easy bullet points. Purity. Purity. So we know that, you know, when you buy chemicals, when you buy anything from the internet, the chances of getting something with a high level of purity um, is relatively low. But the, the level of purity is often stated. You know, it will tell you when you buy this, it is 99% pure. Um, and the question is, can we prove this? And the answer is we can. So purity, um, to measure, to measure purity, to measure purity, you do a melting point test a melting point test so for example let's say let's say you you go to the shop and you buy this is where i've got to be careful now uh the the yeah the, the example that we often talk about is in drugs not the bad drugs not, but the good drugs not yeah that's not gonna work out very well don't take drugs um but to, when you when you buy any any form of a drug, you, you'd want to test its purity. You know, you don't test the purity of the stuff that you buy from the shops like ibuprofen, but you could if you wanted, and you can certainly purify it before taking it if you want to. Um, but essentially, what you do is a rather interesting method. So, if we have a solid, yeah, we've got a solid, and let's call that solid. Uh, let's call it aspirin. Let's do aspirin. Aspirin, otherwise known as salicylic acid. Oops, salicylic acid. So if you wanted to test the purity of your solid aspirin, first of all, what you're going to do is you're going to look up its melting point. So we're going to go um, salicylic acid. I seem to recall the melting point about one. Oh, 158. Wow, much higher than I thought it was going to be. 158.6. So the melting point, MPT, is 158.6 degrees Celsius. So what we're now going to do is we're going to prove this. So what we're going to do is we're going to get a beaker. Going to get a beaker. Should never do three dimensional diagrams if you do diagrams in chemistry. And you've, we're gonna have, we can't use water for this because water has a boiling point of 100. We can't get above 100. So to do this one, we're gonna have to use an oil bath. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our sample. We're gonna take a very small sample of aspirin. And that sample, I'm gonna put in right there. It's a white solid. I'll do it as like gray. There we go. This is our aspirin solid. And I've put it inside a really tiny little tube. Yeah, a little tiny tube. It's called a capillary tube, by the way. Um, and then what I do is I'm going to add then a thermometer, add my thermometer, and I'm now going to fill this with oil. So this is a thermometer. It's going to have to be a really good thermometer as well to go up to 160. This here is called a capillary, 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 cap cap Capillary. Capillary. So it's called capillary. Capillary. Capillary tube. Someone check me. And then here is my solid sample. 
only a tiny amount of it. What I'm now going to do is I'm going to warm up, heat up, yeah, add heat. We're probably not going to do probably not going to do a Bunsen burner. Probably use a heat mat. Capillary. Ah, oh, you've gone mad, haven't I? Capillary. Thank you. Capillary tube. So I'm going to heat it up. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep an eye on the thermometer as it as it rises. And then as soon as I see at first sign, bullet point, as heat rises at the first sign of melting, melting record value from thermometer. That's it. Moment. And then you just compare it. So a pure sample of aspirin will be running around about 158. Yeah, an impure sample will be lower, by the way. It'll be lower. Okay, we can do another one. It can actually be lower or higher, but the, the higher one's a bit more complicated. You don't really need to know much about them. You never need to be able to give a range of GCSE. That's A level. So another one that we have to talk about is purity of water. Purity of water. We know that water, pure water, pure water has a boiling point, boiling point of 100 degrees Celsius. So if we want to test it, take sample, take sample, heat until boiling, heat until boiling, record temperature, record temp. And if it reads 100, it's, oh yeah, I'll add the oil to it as well. This is an oil bath. You can't use water because the melting point of the salicylic acid is above 100. Is oil used because water would boil before the aspirin? Yes, correct, before the aspirin melts. So you then can't get any higher. So you have to use an oil bath in that situation. So it's actually just a melting point or a boiling point. Not particularly complicated. Boil it, record the temperature, and if it's pure, it will read 100. Yeah. Cool. Done for purity. Next. Test for water. Okay. So we have an unknown liquid. Test for water. So the test for water, number one, is anhydrous, which literally translates to mean no water, anhydrous copper sulfate. Now, anhydrous copper sulfate is white. Anhydrous copper sulfate is white. There we go. Anhydrous copper sulfate. In the presence of water, goes uh, changes from white to blue, to blue if water present. Water present. Okay, so just to explain, yeah, there you go. There's the image, someone adding water to it. So what's actually happening, just to show you the equation, is anhydrous copper sulfate is literally that, and it's white. By the way, often described as off-white. That's really not going to help me, is it? Uh, often described as slightly, it's usually like pale, 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 pale blue. Yeah, that's really still, oh, there we go. And it, But it is white. It's meant to be white. If you have really good stuff, it's white. Yeah, white. And then if you add water to it, the equation, you actually add five of them, and you will find, you'll form CuSO4 dot five H2Os, which is a solid, and that there is blue. This is called hydrated, hydrated copper sulfate. Hydrated literally means has water in it, uh, it has drank water. 
you know, you guys hydrate to yourselves. I am hydrating this. By the way, the reaction is totally reversible. Yeah, so this arrow here, whoops, this arrow here means reversible. It means that I can push the, I can push it back again. All I do is heat it up and I will drive it back. I'll evaporate the water away and it'll t turn back to being white. <clears throat> but that's the equation for the test for water. White to blue, that's it. So just learn that. Just literally, I just need anhydrous copper sulfate, white to blue. Just learn that. The equation's quite handy though, quite nice to know. And yes, there is five of them, go figure. Yeah, five molecules of water per copper sulfate. Cool, so there's the test for water. Now I said to do this in the, in the context of what's called the combustion train. So, combustion train, <laughs> images, 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 images. Uh, that is so not what I want. Uh, oh, yeah, there you go. Yeah. Give me a nice picture of that, please. Yes, that'll do. That will do nicely. Hello. Hello. Take all of you. Copy. Hello. Hello. So this is called the this is called the combustion train demo. So there we go. So here's a fact for you. Fact. When when fuels like when fuels like petrol or wax burn, they produce they produce carbon dioxide and water vapor. Yeah, carbon dioxide gas and water gas. So when a candle burns, the gases that are being made here, yeah, are CO2 and water. CO2 and H2O. Now, what we want to do is we want to prove this. So what we first of all need to do is to collect them. That's what this is. This upside down filter funnel, which needs to be made out of glass, by the way. I saw someone do this in plastic once and they melted the funnel. Lol. Um, this upside down filter funnel is just going to collect the gases. Yeah. Um, just looking at what the arrows look to be. So this is just wax or fuel. The a definition of fuel, a substance that can be burned to release energy. Uh oh, I've got questions being coming through to me. I'm just gonna check my phone. I think that my I always worry in case there's a problem with the sound or something. No, it's okay. So yeah, so these are the gases which are CO2 and water vapor. So we need to pull the gases up in here. So in order to do that, we're gonna we're gonna suck it up. So this arrow over here is called a suction pump. Suction pump. There you go. Suction. Sucking. No, that, that sells sucking. That's not right. Suction. Suction pump. There you go, that's better. Suction pump. Right, now what's gonna happen is the gases are now going to travel up this tube here, through here, and they're gonna pass into this U-bend. Now you'll notice that this U-bend is inside a water trough. So this is, an, this is actually an ice bath. You can add this diagram to your notes, guys. It's worthwhile doing it. So the question is, why do we need this in an ice bath? What's the function of the ice bath? On the chat, please, does anyone wanna guess? You guys can write on the chat and I'll give you the answer. See how many people type before I write it. So the reason being is the ice bath will cool gases and turn H2O gas, otherwise known as water vapor or steam, into liquid water. Right, now makes the water vapor turn into liquid. Well done, Julius, good man. 
So now we can test for this guy. Gas to liquid, condense. Yes, both of you are correct. Well done. Good job, Long. Good job, Gayatri. So now we've got this stuff here. So this is our anhydrous, anhydrous copper sulfate, and it's white. Now, if water's present, it will turn blue. Oh, uh, that, that didn't work out very well, did it? It will turn blue in the presence of water. And you go, yay, I can see the water, yay. But the carbon dioxide, so the water vapor drops out. Yeah, but the carbon dioxide will continue through. Yeah, the carbon dioxide will continue through, passes through this tube, and surprise, surprise, it gets bubbled into a solution. And can anyone want to guess what the solution is in here? We're now going to test for carbon dioxide. What is my solution? Chemistry has all the solutions. <laughs> see, what I, see what I did there? We have all the, like, like solutions as in like problems, like solution to, I'm gonna stop. So this is lime water, otherwise known as calcium hydroxide aqueous. Oh, don't like the big C there. Oh, don't, 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 don't. calcium hydroxide aqueous. I'll get rid of that bracket, don't need it. There you go, lime water. Well done, guys. And then this is going to form a white precipitate. White PPT of limestone will form. If you put cloudy, that's okay. I just hate it. It annoys me. And then any leftover gases get taken out by the suction pump. So this works really, really well. It, what it does is it absolutely unequivocally proves that when you burn things like candle wax and petrol, that you make CO2 and water. Even though you can't see the water, the water is definitely there. Yeah, it's just above its boiling point, so it's coming off as an invisible gas. Right, so we can tick off this one now. Boom, next one, acidic and basic oxides. Right, so we actually did this earlier in year 10. So one of the things that you guys learned is that if you take a metal, if you take a metal and you react it with oxygen, what am I going to make, please, guys? Finish off the answer. If I then take a non-metal, a non-metal, and react it with oxygen, what am I going to make? And then I'm going to give you the real examples. So then real examples will be sodium plus oxygen. Any element that ends in en or gen is in pair. Yeah, we're going to form the metal oxide and we're going to form the non-metal oxide. Non-metal oxide. So the example, so guys, complete it please. Give me the formula for that one, please, guys. I love that uh, Zyna straight in there with the correct word. Can you give me the formula, Zyna? Really impressed me. So, and then if I take sulfur and I react that with oxygen, what do I make? Then if I take phosphorus, and I react it with oxygen, what do I make? Well, you guys don't know that one. Uh, uh, if I then take calcium and react it with oxygen, what do I make? Okay, so I'm gonna make sodium oxide, but then we need to give the formula for this. So sodium oxide is what I'm making. How do I build its formula? Sodium is plus one, because it's group one. Oxygen is two minus, because it's group six. Cross and down, well done, Zyner. Na, little two, subscript two, O. Now balance the equation. Uh, two oxygens, two oxygens, four sodiums, four sodiums. Next, sulfur, I'm gonna make SO2, sulfur dioxide. You guys have to know that. So if you ever have sulfur reacting with oxygen, you're going to get SO2. Yeah, sulfur dioxide, learn that one. Phosphorus, ooh, this one's a tricky one. This actually forms phosphorus pentoxide. Phosphorus pentoxide, which is actually P2O. Uh, I've said P4O10, I think. I think that's correct. Yeah. Uh, people are going to ask me, why is it pent when pent is five? Because the empirical is... P, P, 
P2O5. That's the empirical formula. The simplest whole number ratio of atoms. Yeah, but it's actually P4O10 that it actually forms. And then calcium oxide is just going to be CaO because calcium is in group two plus two, oxygen's in two minus, their charges cancel, CaO. Balance the equation. The sulfur one's balanced, that one's balanced. Phosphorus is definitely not balanced. Need five of those, that's now done. Calcium, definitely not. Double it and double it and I'm done. Right, so all of these equations, we've got two non-metals and two metals. Oxides. <laughs> so what we discovered is that if you take these, there are two classes then. We have got metal oxides. Metal oxides. And we have non-metal oxides. Now the question is, non-metal oxides, are they acidic or basic? So it's a very easy test. So the way that you do this, and we can simply just do, we can go, um, so if we go XO2, I like that. So we don't know, we don't know whether that's a metal, question mark, or a non-metal. Well, we can easily find out. What we're going to do is add to water, add to water, followed by, so you add a small amount of the sample, yeah, and then step two, so this is number one, number two, add universal, universal indicator. And the reason being is that non-metal uh, oxides, fact, so learn this, I'll put it in red. Learn, this is a nota bene. Yeah. Metal oxides, make my writing bigger. Metal oxides are basic. What that means is alkali. pH above seven, above seven. Universal indicator changes from green to purple. We know this. Green to purple, telling us it's an alkali. So metal oxides will turn purple, pH usually about 12 to 14 pH 12 to 14, purple. I don't know, I just base, I'm just gonna do that. Next one, non-metal oxides. Non-metal oxides are acidic. They're the opposite. They're acidic. The universal indicator will change from green to red. And you're done. If you're interested in the equations, if you're interested, just to show you some of these. So number one, so these are equations. Equations. So um, calcium oxide reacts with water to form calcium hydroxide. And it's the OH minus ion that makes this alkali. We know that that ion is what makes an alkali an alkali. Yeah, that turns it purple. Yeah, that's what makes this an alkali. Yeah, if you do SO2, SO2 reacts with water to form sulfurous acid, not sulfuric but sulfurous acid, and of course, it's an acid, so it's gonna break apart and give me H plus. That breaks to give me H plus, which is what makes an acid an acid. So that there is what makes an acid an acid. There we go. If you're interested in the others, if you're interested in some others, uh, I'll leave that there for a second. Others include 
So um, sodium oxide reacts with water to form sodium hydroxide. Two of them, in fact. And that's very alkali. There's the OH minus ion. That's now going to dissolve and release this into the solution, which is what makes an alkali. An alkali, another metal oxide. And whereas if I do something like... Um, if I do something like uh, P, P4O10, add it to water, I will make phosphoric acid, H3PO4. That's phosphoric acid. Now I need to balance for that. Four phosphoruses, four phosphoruses. Uh, hydrogens, 12. And then oxygens might add up. Four times four is, 60, is 16. 16 all adds up. And this is phosphoric acid phosphoric acid, if you're interested, which then releases H+, which is what makes it an acid. So we realize that there's this duality. The metal, learn this bit. That's what I need you to take away from this, guys. Just that. We can sum up. All my notes are wonderful, but in reality, these are what I need you to learn. Learn that. That's just awesome. We love that. Melting point, yeah. And that finishes my lesson today. And it brings us to the end of um, chemical tests. End of chemical tests. I like it, that's it. All in good time. There we go. Right guys, we're done. So your test on Tuesday is going to be on, uh, I'll share my screen again. Stop screen, oh, that one there, nope, that one. So your test on Tuesday, your test is on ionic, ionic bonding. It is on electrolysis. It's going to be a hard test and chemical tests. Watch my videos back on YouTube. Have a look at the homeworks you've completed and you will be just fine. This is one of the harder tests that you will sit in your tent. It'll be really nice to see how you guys get on. I will see you all next week. Have a nice weekend, everybody. Take care.